All right, we're going to continue on with LLLC defensive driving. Defensive driving is something that should be very familiar to all of us. Um, some of you may know it in other terms other than LLLC, but the concepts are all the same. So we're gonna quickly go through some of those and there's some videos that you'll watch. Uh, so as you can see, uh, Kermit there is a very safe driver. He's got a seat belt on. He's uh, getting the big picture, looking all around. Um, yeah, and then and then you've got the cat. The cat, I, I don't think it's got a seat belt on. Um, the precious cargo, I'm, I'm not sure what's precious other than the kitty, I mean, he's cute. He does have both hands on the steering wheel, not at nine and three, but I don't know. I don't know about that guy. I don't know if he could be a bus driver. Kermit, though, I'd hire him. The four driving principles to safety help you see, think, and act your way through any traffic situation. Now, these principles allow you to maintain the maximum amount of room around your vehicle. They improve your visibility, and they provide you with extra time to make decisions while driving. So, Robbie, not to get impatient, but what exactly is driving principle number one? Well, driving principle number one is look ahead. Looking ahead will help you remove or reduce risk. So let's see how it works. Look ahead means that you look far ahead of the bus while you're driving. To do this, use at least a 15 second eye lead time. Look out beyond where you are now, to a point where the bus will be in the next 15 seconds. For instance, at 30 miles per hour, when you look ahead 15 seconds, it means you're looking out to about 650 feet or approximately one and a half city blocks. Right now, our driver is looking ahead all the way out to this point. On the highway at 50 miles per hour, that same 15 second eye lead time extends your vision to at least 1,100 feet ahead of you, nearly a quarter of a mile. Now the driver is looking out this far in front of the bus. That's what we mean when we say look ahead. Unfortunately, most drivers only look three or four seconds ahead. In fact, amateur drivers usually just watch the back end of the vehicle right in front of them. They don't even know they should look further out into the distance. Now that means when a problem develops up ahead, well, the driver only has a few seconds to see it, evaluate it, decide what to do about it, and then take action. Now that's not enough time. It's also why so many accidents happen. The look ahead principle helps you identify potential hazards long before they can hurt you. Look ahead gives you more time to see and understand the hazard, evaluate it, and safely react to it, thereby reducing risk. For example, you may need to change lanes, slow down, or even bring your bus to a full stop. But when you look ahead, you'll have plenty of time to do it. And you'll avoid unnecessary stops and starts. And, of course, panic stops, which are uncomfortable for you and your passengers. Has this ever happened to you? You're driving along on a busy road. Traffic's moving okay and everyone's going about the same speed. And you suddenly notice road construction ahead of you. You have to slow down or maybe even stop. Well, as the Boy Scouts say, be prepared. Looking ahead lets you know what's coming so you can prepare early for what's about to happen. You can slow down, change lanes, or even stop. Look ahead prevents a lot of accidents, but not all by itself. Now we'll cover the other three driving principles to safety in a minute, but first let's review. Look ahead involves distance and gives you time to react. It's a defensive driving skill that you can learn, and over time you can make it a safe driving habit. Now it begins with a basic understanding, which you now have. Next, it takes thoughtful action on your part. When you first start to use this principle, you have to give it a lot of thought. You almost have to remind yourself throughout the day by saying it out loud. Look ahead, look ahead, look ahead. Okay, well, maybe you shouldn't say it out loud too much, <laughs> but you can think it. Remind yourself every 15 or 20 minutes until it finally becomes a habit. It took me some time to make this an automatic habit, but the effort was worth it. Now I always look well ahead and I know what's coming up. I can just adjust accordingly and it makes my driving easier. I can slow down, change lanes sooner when needed, and it makes driving less stressful. You should make looking ahead your habit too. Oh, and one final thing. As a professional driver, you have to look farther ahead than a car driver. The bus is bigger and heavier and needs more time and distance to stop. So remember to always look ahead a minimum of 15 seconds. 
Of course, the information you need to drive safely and avoid accidents isn't just right in front of you. It's all around you. And that's what the second principle is all about. Look around. Driving principle number two, look around, means you have to take in the entire scene when you're driving, especially when driving a bus. Remember, you can only remove or reduce the risk from a hazard if you recognize it. By continually looking around, you'll be able to recognize any unexpected hazards. It could be a bicycle, a pedestrian, or even a car trying to squeeze by you at an intersection. To be aware of your surroundings, you have to constantly move your head and eyes to see everything around the bus. Look around for other cars, pedestrians, and fixed or movable objects in or near the road. And make sure you look around while turning and anticipate the actions of other drivers and pedestrians. Look around means you change your focus every three to five seconds. Most of the time you are going to be looking ahead, but every three to five seconds you should be looking around and absorbing all that is happening so you can allow for it. If you constantly look around, you'll notice things that are changing as they change. When you see them sooner rather than later, you have more time to adjust for the changes in your environment. Well, for example, a car pulls up alongside of you on the highway, a child's ball bounces out into the street from her front yard, or a deer suddenly jumps out from the woods on the side of a country road. If you're driving with a fixed stare or you don't keep moving your eyes and head, you won't notice these potential hazards in time to react to them. That's right, Robbie. Constant eye and head movement also helps to keep you alert and aware. It prevents you from daydreaming, which often comes from fatigue. If you don't remain alert, it's possible to slip into a fixed stare, which is very dangerous. Of course, moving your head and eyes increases your field of vision as well. But did you know that there are actually two types of vision? Wait, I know this one. Nope, lost it. Okay. <laughs> well, there's central vision and peripheral vision. Oh, I see. Central vision is right in front of you. It's what you're focused on, and it's usually no more than 18 degrees wide. Now, this diagram shows just how limited your central vision actually is. Now, let's see how the diagram applies to a bus operator. As you can see, there are a lot of things going on outside your central vision, things that can lead to accidents. Moving your head and eyes extends the range of your central vision to the left and right. But you also have peripheral vision, which allows you to notice things up to 80 degrees on each side. Now, that gives you a field of vision of about 160 degrees. But peripheral vision only gives you a sense of color and movement it doesn't give you an accurate image of a particular hazard. So keep your eyes and head moving at all times, and you'll avoid any surprises. Look around also means that you frequently check your mirrors. Your mirrors increase your range of vision even more. It's important to know what's going on behind you and to either side of the bus, and your mirrors give you that information. You should check your mirrors every five to eight seconds. Constantly moving your head and eyes and checking your mirrors gives you more information and increases your awareness of what's going on around your bus. It also gives you more time to react to any changes that pose additional risks. Sometimes just a half second of warning is all you need to avoid an accident. Here are a few ways that you can put principle number two, look around, into practice. At intersections, look left, right, and left again before proceeding. Check the left twice because the first vehicle that can hit you will usually come from that direction. Look around for pedestrians on the nearby sidewalks or in the crosswalks. Use the rock and roll procedure to eliminate any blind spots caused by your mirrors or the frame around your front windshield. Well, Robbie, maybe we should explain that a little bit more. Well, we teach this procedure in the intersections course, but it really is a great example of look around, so let me cover it briefly. Whenever you're stopped at an intersection where there might be pedestrians, rock your whole body, shoulders and head forward and backward and from side to side while you scan the entire intersection. The rock and roll procedure helps you see around your mirrors and window frames. Do it while you're stopped and be sure to look in every direction. Then, as you start into the intersection, do the rock and roll again to make sure the area is still clear. This is extremely important when turning, especially when turning to the left. Look around. It's so easy to say, but you have to continually work at it to make it an automatic habit. Now, before I ever move the bus, I scan around everywhere I can. Initially, I need to keep telling myself, look around, look around, look around. Now I do it automatically. Oh, me too. And remember, pedestrians and other drivers don't have your advanced knowledge or professional skills. They might not be paying attention or looking out for you. And don't fool yourself into thinking that they can't possibly miss that great big bus you're driving. They really don't even see you sometimes. Now I can see how the first two principles work together. 
look ahead and look around, both give you more information and time to react to everything going on around your bus. That's right. The first two principles for driving safely help you collect and process information. Information that you need to remove or reduce risk and avoid accidents. Okay, LLLC defensive driving. We have look ahead, look around, leave room, and communicate. These are all terms that everybody that I'm speaking to should be familiar with. So, here's the video for look around. Next, we have look around. Looking around means moving your eyes every three to five seconds. Um, if, you, if you look straight ahead and you move your eyes side to side, you can see good, a good amount with your peripheral, right? But if you move your head, you can see even more. So move your eyes every three to five seconds. Um, doing this gives you more time to react, especially if you're applying the look ahead principle. Um, when you are looking ahead and looking around, if you practice that, you're going to have a much broader view of what is around you. And it gives you more time to make those decisions on what you should do in case of an incident ahead. It gives you the option and the ability to see the potential hazards a lot sooner and then be able to react. It also prevents daydreaming or um, being complacent. Um, complacency is a big issue with drivers I know it, I've done it, it's, it's no fun to get to where you're going and you don't remember how you got there. So keeping your eyes moving, keeping your head moving, looking around and looking ahead, all prevent that uh, daydreaming effect. Check your mirrors every five to eight seconds. There's seven mirrors in a bus. You should look at all seven mirrors every five to eight seconds. That means, I like to say, I like to say be a bobblehead. You start on your left, Boom, 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 right, down, and up. Make it a U shape. Then check your seventh, your, your student mirror. Um, that's your seventh mirror. So every five to eight seconds, you should be looking in all your mirrors, not five seconds you look in one, five seconds you look in another. It's every mirror every five to eight seconds. And then the old rock and roll. We all know about the rock and roll, right? Uh, rocking and rolling is actually physically moving your body in your chair. Make sure that you look around the pillars, you look around those mirror posts. It's so easy to lose objects and vehicles and people in those blind spots. Uh, when you go through your safety blitz with your training supervisor, they should be uh, having you do the rock and roll and really acknowledge in, in your bus where those blind spots are. So now we have two driving principles to safely help us gather information and give us more time to react and to reduce the risk created by things going on around us. What's next? Well, driving principle number three is leave room. Now this principle also gives you added time to react and it acts like a buffer between you and everything else in the world that you could possibly collide with. Imagine driving out in the middle of a big empty desert. No other cars or trucks, no pedestrians, no trees, light poles, mailboxes, or parked cars. Now certainly, this would be a lot easier and a lot safer. There'd be nothing to hit. <laughs> but that's not where we have to drive. We have to drive on streets and highways and in parking lots, all filled with fixed objects and other vehicles. And those other vehicles are all being controlled by other people who usually don't have professional driver training. That's why you want to keep as much space as possible between them and your bus. The more space you can create around you, the safer you are. And leaving room around your bus gives you time to make adjustments, even when other drivers make mistakes, cut you off, pull in front of you, or run a red light when it's your turn to go. Leave room gives you that extra second to avoid an accident. Remember, you have complete control over the space in front of you. By leaving room, you greatly reduce the risk of a rear-end collision. Reducing the risk means you're safer. Did you know around 30% of all vehicle accidents in North America are rear-end collisions? Now that's just ridiculous when that percentage can be greatly reduced just by leaving room. Now, ideally, you want extra room on all six sides of the bus, 
in front to the rear on each side of the bus and above and below the bus. And of course, the easiest place to leave room is right in front of your bus. You simply adjust your speed to maintain a safe following distance. This is the one space that you totally control. Again, your bus takes a lot longer and more distance to stop than a car, van, or pickup truck. You need extra space to make up for all that extra weight you have. In clear, dry weather with good visibility, you need at least a four second following distance. If you're following too closely behind the vehicle in front of you, you won't have time to react to any sudden change they might make. In fact, the most dangerous situation is when they suddenly break. A four second following distance gives you more control. It gives you more time to react and more time and distance to stop the bus. To figure the four second following distance, scan ahead to find a fixed reference point, a sign, a stoplight, or some other road element. Then when the vehicle in front of you passes that object, count off four seconds like this. 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004. If you reach the object in less than four seconds, well, you're following too closely. Slow down and increase your following distance to at least four seconds. However, when driving in adverse weather, you need even more space in front of you. The best practice is to add one additional second of following distance for each adverse condition. So then rain would be five, snow would be six, and ice or sleet is seven. Now those are road conditions, right? What about visibility issues? Good point. Fog is actually the worst condition of all. If your sight distance is less than four seconds, even at slow speeds, you need to pull over and stop. And speaking of sight distance, when you're driving at night, regardless of weather conditions, you need to be able to stop within the distance you can see with your headlights. Of course, leaving room isn't always as easy as it sounds. Every time you slow down and back off, somebody else cuts into the space in front of you. Now, sometimes it feels like you'd have to put into reverse to maintain a safe following distance. I agree with you there, Michael. But you have to adjust for other drivers' mistakes. And it's really not quite that bad. Simply maintain your four seconds. If someone tries to steal it from you, back off and reestablish four seconds. Remember, you own that space in front of your bus. You control how big it is. When I started driving a bus, I needed to visualize what a four second following distance was at different speeds. I would check this every now and then to make sure I was at least four seconds back. Now, I have a really good feel for the right following distance and I automatically stay back at least four seconds. I still recheck occasionally, but now I feel uncomfortable if I'm not always at least four seconds back. Now the spaces to either side of your bus and behind you are a little harder to keep clear. Sometimes to maintain room in the rear, you have to actually slow down to motivate an impatient tailgater to move to another lane or to back off. Also, you can't always leave room to your sides. But when you're on a multi-lane highway and someone comes up alongside of you, simply adjust your speed and drop back a bit so they aren't right next to you. Of course, this isn't possible when driving slowly in congested traffic, but whenever you can, keep that space open so you can avoid a sideswipe accident. And finally, drivers seem to always forget about the space above and below their bus. But remember, your bus is a lot taller than a car, van, or a pickup truck. You have to be on the lookout for low overhangs. And remember, they're not always marked with a warning sign. And that goes for low-hanging tree limbs and drooping wires. You even have to be on the lookout for a garage door that somebody didn't open all the way. <laughs> and that's just the stuff above you. Exactly. You also have to watch out for what happens beneath you. When driving, scan ahead looking for debris on the roadway or uneven road surfaces around construction zones that can cause you to bottom out. We can't emphasize enough how important it is to leave room around your bus, especially when it comes to the four second following distance. Think about it. If everyone in front of you always acted like they were supposed to, you wouldn't need this extra room. But we know that other drivers don't drive professionally and we have to allow for their mistakes. Another way of saying that we allow for other drivers' mistakes is to expect the unexpected. Don't let them surprise you. Now expect the unexpected means. The car ahead of you realizes that they're about to miss an important turn and suddenly stop. A child or an animal runs out in front of you. A car suddenly pulls over on the highway due to an emergency, like a flat tire. Traffic in the opposing lane crosses into your lane. Now, as a professional driver or operator, you need to leave room for all of these possibilities and others that will happen from time to time. 
I'm sure there are a lot of drivers out there that don't keep a four second following distance and have never had an accident. What do you say to them? Well, they're living on luck. Anytime your following distance drops below four seconds, you're taking a chance. You're engaged in an unsafe behavior. And as you learned in the Safety Best Practices program, repeated often enough, that unsafe behavior will eventually, will in fact, will always lead to an accident. Just because it hasn't happened before, doesn't mean it won't happen tomorrow or the next day. That's why the four second following distance is so important. Remember, expect the unexpected. Leave room and maintain at least a four second following distance. And that's good advice for any driver, but especially important for a professional school bus driver. Because of the bus's size, it takes you longer to stop. But if you have a little extra time and a little extra space around you, you can anticipate trouble and avoid accident causing situations. Leave room helps you reduce the risk and avoid accidents, panic stops, and evasive maneuvers. It helps you give your passengers the safe and pleasant ride they deserve. So the leaving room principles. Um, when you leave room, it gives you time to make adjustments. When you incorporate all of these principles together, you look ahead, you look around, you leave room. All that does is make you more aware of your surroundings and very, very capable of making adjustments when hazards come up. It gives you complete control of the space in the front of your bus. The space in the front of your bus is really the best control that you have when it comes to any space around your bus. It's hard to control what's behind you. It's somewhat difficult to control what's beside your bus, but in front of your bus, you can always control how much space there is between you and what's in front of you. Four seconds following distance. So uh, that just means that you count four seconds ahead and that's where you should be. If you need any more clarification on what that means or how to do that to test yourself, please talk to your training coach and they will instruct you and give you some ideas. Try to keep open space around your bus as much as possible. If you see that there's a vehicle spacing you on your left or pacing, not spacing, pacing you on your left, why not just slow down, let them get ahead of you. Now you've got more space in front of you and beside you and you're traveling in the right hand lane because that's where we travel as buses. So you shouldn't have anything on your right either. Uh, so if you can clear up all that space around your bus, it just makes it so much safer when you have to account for hazards that you come across. Overhead clearance. Overhead clearance is uh, fortunately something that most of you don't have to deal with on a daily basis here. We don't have a lot of overpasses that are really low. We don't have a lot of uh, bridges that we go under. The biggest thing that we come across here is tree branches. Um, learning your overhead clearance and knowing how tall your bus is and if you're going to be able to fit under something is really important. Again, if you're not quite sure how to do that, talk to your training coach and they will help you. I think it's your turn to talk. What? Talk. Oh. <laughs> yeah. The last principle, principle number four, is communicate. In other words, make sure that other drivers, pedestrians, and anyone around your bus knows that you're there and what you're planning to do next. Of course, you probably think they know you're there since you're driving a big yellow bus, but through experience, we've learned that some people seem to think we're invisible. Other drivers and pedestrians aren't always as attentive and safety conscious as you are. And even though you're driving a bus, sometimes people won't even notice that you're there. So what do you do? Communicate. First, a friendly tap on the horn is a good way to get someone's attention, but you still have to give a quick glance to make sure that they know you're there. Try to make eye contact. Another way to communicate is with your headlights. You may even have local rules or regulations that require you to keep your headlights on at all times. That's right. But even if you don't, a good rule of thumb is anytime you need your windshield wipers, Turn on your light so the other guy can see you. 
Even a slight mist, snow flurries, fog, or light rain will limit everyone's visibility. That's true. Another way to communicate is with your brake lights. As you approach any intersection, gently touch your brake pedal to indicate that you might have to stop. Remember, the driver behind you can't see around your big yellow bus and has no idea whether or not you have a red light or a stop sign coming up. And be sure to use your turn signals before turning or changing lanes. Always allow at least three flashes before taking any action. How many times have you watched another driver turn right, turn left, or go straight and you had no idea what they were about to do because they didn't use their turn signals? It's not only frustrating, it's downright dangerous. Don't force the other guy into reading your mind. Tell them what you plan to do and tell them in advance by signaling at least three flashes before you turn or change lanes. In all my years driving a bus, I've found that communication is critical to being a safe driver. If I know what the other vehicle is going to do, I can react accordingly and reduce the risk from the other driver making an unexpected move. The same applies to maneuvers I plan on making. I like to be a very courteous driver. I wave people on, I smile, I make eye contact. The more we communicate, the safer we'll be. And remember, this course is all about defensive driving, allowing for the mistakes made by others. Even when you're driving safely and have the right of way, other drivers will make mistakes. Whether it's a car or a pedestrian, communicating will go a long way toward preventing accidents. Great. Okay, the way we communicate, we're going to recap here. Headlights. Headlights indicate that the bus is on. Uh, the bus is moving, maybe. Uh, just, it, it's a communication tool for other drivers. Brake lights are a big one. Uh, when you use your brake lights, that allows others to know that you're slowing down. When you're in a railroad track, even if you have your emergency brake on, if you keep your foot on the service brake, it allows for those brake lights to come on and other people behind you know that you're stopped. Turn signals, very important, very underrated in this district I've seen. Uh, not just motorists on the road, but bus drivers. I've seen a lot of people that just think that they're a suggestion. They're not, uh, they're a form of communication to everyone around. Uh, when you use your turn signal, it communicates to others around you that you're making a traffic maneuver, allowing them to process what you're doing and to accommodate for that. Your horn. Oh, this one I know y'all know. This one is a form of communication uh, sometimes when it shouldn't be. So um, out at Rocky Mountain, Good example, last fall, uh, buses leaving, nose to bumper, uh, students were trying to cross in that crosswalk and instead of stopping, the driver honked their horn to warn the kids to get out of the way. So many safety issues with this. Uh, so the horn should be used in a last resort method uh, to warn people that there's danger. We use it in loading zones uh, or, or uh, when you're crossing students, right? When you blow on that horn, you teach your student that there's a car coming and to go back to where they came from. Um, we use it to warn people maybe that are behind us that can't see a car cutting, us, uh, cutting in front of us. Um, it, they should be used in those times of danger so they don't become complacent and we don't just think, oh, somebody's blowing a horn again. It actually is a warning device. Eye contact is a great form of communication. Uh, when you see somebody make eye contact with you outside of the bus, that allows you to know that they've seen you. When they see you, we know that they acknowledge that you're there. It's the people that don't see us, the ones that don't make eye contact, that you need to predict for. You need to make sure that if they haven't made eye contact with you, then maybe you don't go until they're out of your way. You don't want to uh, cause a collision or be in a collision because somebody didn't make eye contact and didn't see you. Even though we're in a big yellow bus and they see us when we don't want them to, there's a lot of times they don't see us. Consequences. 
Let's talk about some consequences. This little video. All right. So as you can see, it's not just disciplinary consequences that we are up against. It's actual human lives, human, um, human beings that are being uh, affected by unsafe behaviors. Uh, there will be disciplinary actions when, you know, things happen out there on the road, but your ultimate concern should be the lives that you deal with on a daily basis, the ones that you come across daily. So please make sure that you understand how important safety is, that how important defensive driving is, and how much we want to support you on making safe decisions. Please come and talk to us. If you have safety concerns, um, and they're valid safety concerns, if you have a safety concern and you have a way to fix it or an idea to fix it that isn't like gonna cost a million dollars, come and talk to us. You know, maybe we can work something out. Uh, maybe I'll put you on the safety committee and you can uh, implement some of these, these issues or these problem solving things. So, all right. Um High definition, this is Fox 2 News. First on Fox tonight, a deadly wreck on Interstate 44 for a high school band on its way to Six Flags for a day of fun. The scene absolutely horrific with buses smashed together and then the tragic news, a student on one bus killed as well as a young man inside a truck at the bottom of the pile. We begin our team coverage tonight in Villa Ridge near Gray Summit with Fox 2's Paul Shankman. Paul. Tom, this may not be the worst accident that ever happened on this stretch of Interstate 44, but it's the worst anybody can seem to remember out here. A pickup truck smashing into the back of a tractor trailer's tractor, then a bus smashing into the pickup and another bus smashing into the first bus. Incredible. It took most of the afternoon just to be able to get to the bodies and get them removed from those vehicles. The buses, as you said, were full of band kids from John F. Hodge High School in St. James. The first bus, all girls, the rear, all boys. They were headed for a play day at Six Flags. But at 10.15, traffic on eastbound Interstate 44 near Villa Ridge was backing up because of road construction ahead. Then a fatal coincidence. A pickup truck driver smashes into the back of a trailerless truck. At that exact same moment, the driver of the first bus was checking her mirrors after having just changed lanes to avoid a car on the shoulder, causing her to not see the accident ahead and suddenly become part of it. And an instant later, the second bus hit the first. When help arrived, students were triaged by the side of the road. Most of their injuries were moderate to minor, some taken away by ambulance, others by bus, and still others by parents. But sadly, one female student did not survive. The left front of that bus struck the right rear of the first bus. The, the fatal subject was in the last seat, last uh, seat of the first bus, right rear of the first bus. She was killed by the second bus. Uh, at, at this point, this is what we, we're saying, yes. We've had a very horrific accident today, and I want, to, want the families to know that they, my heart goes out to them, all the families in St. James, not just not all the families that have been involved. And it's been a horrible, horrible day in our community, and it will be felt forever. Help came quickly from 10 fire and EMS departments with at least 75 emergency workers on the scene. It took several hours before they could begin pulling apart the wreckage. By about 3.30 this afternoon, the interstate was reopened. The highway patrol has not identified the young woman who was killed in this crash, but Fox 2 News has learned that the victim in the pickup was 19-year-old Daniel Schatz of Sullivan, Missouri, and with more...